together, uh, wherever you are. Um, uh, Daniel Stein is, uh, is um, driving as fast as he can through the deserted streets of Santa Barbara to get to his office because he has no internet at his home. It is now three o'clock in the morning or uh, in, in Santa Barbara. So that is, uh, we're, we're hoping he doesn't drive too fast uh, and takes his time and, and arrives when he arrives. Um, so in the meantime, I will welcome you to the 19th session of Unrehearsed Futures, in which I have the great uh, good fortune of having with me uh, Norman Taylor and soon to be Daniel Stein. Um, and we are, uh, this uh, session is auspiciously titled, Mime is Dead, Long Live Mime. Uh, I would like to introduce Norman. I will read a little bit about Norman. Um, and when Daniel arrives, I will read you a little bit about Daniel as well. So Norman Taylor is widely regarded as one of the finest international ambassadors of the pedagogy of Jacques Lecoq. Norman taught alongside Lecoq at the Ecole Lecoq for almost 20 years. He's one of the few remaining first generation master teachers of this school and is an authentic holder of this powerful pedagogic lineage. His speciality is movement analysis and he has taught in over 30 countries at some of the world's finest theater conservatories. He is uniquely qualified to teach the teachers the movement of pedagogy of Jacques Lecoq of which he is an has an unparalleled understanding. Norman is one of the pedagogic guides of Embodied Poetics, a new center for the practices of ensemble devised theater. Um, and uh, it is a pleasure to have him with us. Um, now, Norman, um, I was going to uh, let you kick off with some opening reflections on uh, this controversial title, Mime is Dead, Long Live Mime, or basically whatever you would like to say as by way of introduction. Okay. Thank you very much. Um, mime is dead. Mime cannot be dead, in fact. Uh, depends, always depends what we mean by the word mime. Does it have a small M or a capital M? Is it a style of theatre or is it the very essence of life? This is the thing. In my, in, you always, I always think about a mimosa, the sensitive plants, right? When you touch the mimosa leaf, then it uh, it, it re reacts. It now it's the wrong rhythm completely. It you touch it, and it closes almost, and then gradually it will come open again. So they are this is they are sensitive plants. They are bashful, shy, and timid, like me, right? Um, but they are sensitive. And if so, if mime is an art form, a form of theatre, okay, is it? also, or is it beneath that, the essence of life? When you walk through, uh, Daniel's uh, Daniel. Daniel's here, Daniel's here. Daniel's Daniel, here. Uh, Norman, I'm, I'm sorry, Norman. I had no internet at home. I had oh, to drive to my office. That's terrifying, that's terrifying. We're so glad you're here and you're safe and sound. I'm, me too. So Norman, Norman was just speaking about a bit about mime and this title, Mime is Dead, Long Live Mime. Sorry, Norman, please continue. Okay, I was just saying that, is it an art form or is it the very essence of life? And I was talking about mimosa, is a sensitive plant. And when Raina um, Maki Iso, Julie Beauvais, Brian Brown, when those people walk through a forest, they are Raina Maki Iso, Julie Beauvais, Brian Brown. Okay, they're walking through a forest. Inevitably, they will have some sense of the vertical. There is not one tree in the world which is vertical, but those people and you will have a sense of the vertical. When the same three people are in front of the Pacific Ocean, on the sand or on the rocks, or when they're looking at the Pacific Ocean, or yeah, looking at it, they will be themselves, but they will be qualitatively different. They will have the sense of a vertical, ah, but why? Ah, because they will have the sense, an immensely deep sense of the horizontal and the rhythm of the planet, in fact. They're the same people, but if we allow ourselves, we can be qualitatively different working through a forest and looking at, observing the Pacific Ocean. This is, so this is the very essence of being. Uh -huh. When we are young, 
we learn, we walk on all fours, and then we see the adults who are standing up, and each adult walks a bit funny, but you know, we don't see that. And then the baby mimes what they see, what he or she sees, and they mime it. And of course, they make all sorts of mistakes. They see that their the foot comes off the ground, so they lift up their feet, and they have this funny walk sometimes. But they are miming all this. This is when we learn everything by miming. This morning I went shopping, right? And there was a, you have, there's, a there's one shop which is organic. You go into, you have to get your caddy, we call them a caddy, a trolley, right? You, you wipe it off, you clean it. And then there's a long slope, about I don't know, 15 meters, and then another 15 meters, right? And on the way up there, there was I. Suddenly, I was going from left to right to left to right because I love watching Formula One racing. And when the safety car is out, the, the, the Formula One cars have to go slower, but they go, they, they, they steer from left to right to left to right to left to right in order to keep the, the heat, the, the tires warm enough for the race. And there I was doing it, and I thought, hang on, what am I doing? Oh, yes. Oh, okay. Why do I do I didn't think about doing it, I just did it, right? And then you think about the shard of ice. Who said that? Oh, Graham Greene. Graham Greene, I think it was him, the writer. He said that he could live like everybody else lives. And he could be in the waiting room of a hospital and be there and see the family of a young man who had had a motorbike accident and it was a question of life or death. And he could live that situation with them, but, or and, he could use it in his writing. And he described it, I think, as a shard of ice in his heart. Mm -hmm. I, I don't like I don't like the coldness of that. You see that? Mm -hmm. um, and then, yeah, sorry. Let, yeah. let me let me take this opportunity now yeah. to introduce Daniel and good. let him make also his opening remarks. Yeah, good, Daniel. Hello. Um, let me introduce you. Uh, yeah, Daniel Stein is a senior lecturer at the University of California, Santa Barbara. After studying at Carnegie Mellon University, notably with Jewel Walker, Daniel spent, went to Paris, France, to study with Etienne de Creux, becoming Mr. de Creux's frequent translator. Daniel's solo performances have toured more than 30 countries, as well as in theaters such as the Kennedy Center and the Lincoln Center here in the, in the United States. He has taught master classes throughout the world at institutions such as Juilliard, Shanghai Theater Academy. Daniels ha has received grants from the National Endowment for the Arts and the United States Japan Commission, the Pew Charitable Trust, and is a John Simon Guggenheim Fellow. Um, you worked at Brown University and also at the Dell Arts School in Blue Lake, California, before going to UC Santa Barbara. Um, Daniel, what would you like to say by way of preamble to this uh, session on Mime is Dead, Long Live Mime? But first, I need to I apologize for my late arrival. Um, as I say, it's it's three thirty in the morning here in the United States on Cal in California, and I woke up this morning to be on this call a half an hour early, and there is no internet in my home, so I had to get in my car and drive to my office, which is quarantined. So I'm hoping nobody knocks on my door to tell me I need to evacuate the premise. So I say that as a prelude. Uh, so I'm, you know, I'm going to be contrarian, uh, terribly contrarian. Norman, uh, who I adore, uh, and Amy, who I adore, and thank you very much for inviting me. Uh, I'm I'm coming to mime from a perspective of theater, rather than from mime from a perspective of um, anthropology. I think I think that theater is anthropology on steroids or anthropology on its feet. And I'm interested in theater because of that aspect of it. So when I think about mime and the idea of reflecting, so I'm going to make a little drawing here and I'm hoping everybody can see me. I was all set up so wonderfully at home and now I'm, I'm changing everything. But if, if, if we look at the way light works and the way the way we generally think about theater. Often people say theater is a reflection of life. So we have light that goes into a mirror, if you will. And it comes back 
in exactly the, the opposite direction of the light that goes into the mirror and, and comes back at us. This is, this is what Norman is explaining as mime. We, we see something, we understand what we see, and we try to mimic what, in fact, we have seen. I come at it from a perspective that instead of a mirror here, in fact, theater is a prism. And so what's going to happen to the light when it comes in is that, in fact, it is going to be broken. And instead of going back as the whole light that came in to go back as it was, it is going to transform into all of its spectrum of colors. Now, one will say that this is not what we see, but in fact, it's what theater sees. And so we then have the opportunity to look at the individual, if you could, if I could break this line into all of its spectrum, if you will, there would be, I don't know how many different colors there are that come out of a, 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 a prism, but I'm assuming there are dozens and dozens. This line would break into dozens and dozens. The same as this line would break into dozens and dozens were we able to see it. And the reason I do theater is because I'm actually interested in, ex in exploring the breaking of the the light that we are seeing, the life that we are seeing. And then we can look at the individual parts of that life and either detail, you know, we could decide to detail this one and not even deal with this one. Does that sort of make sense? Yes, okay, so this is wonderful. So we have two different working notions of what mime is. And uh, what neither of you is talking about, of course, is the style of pantomime. Um, and so, uh, so if we say mime is dead, um, we might say perhaps that pantomime is no longer very uh, visible in uh, the, among the refracted light spectrums that are emitted by the prism of theater, pantomime is no longer very often reflected on stage. Um, if, if this type of mime, this very formal type of mime, uh, uh, sort of died, what killed it? That's a question for both of you. What, what was it that changed in the zeitgeist that this very, um, uh, very stylized form of mimesis became less favored? It was a dead end street. That's why it died. The way it was used, the way it was done, pushed it into a dead end street. Lecoq said, and I remember him when I was in the third year as an assistant there, he went up to a student, he was teaching the, the passeur, I think, and he went up to the student and said, uh, ne bouge pas comme moi, bouge comme toi. Don't move like I move, move like you move. And the student was trying to do the exercise that Jack Lecoq had showed him. And Lecoq said, no, don't do that. Move like you move, don't move like I move. Now, there are certain, I can't think of any famous mimes, no, ugh. Um, Mr. Hammer, Marteau, I think. Marteau, well, no, 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 right? And I, I, I don't, didn't know him. I was most taken by him when I was a young man in London, a younger man in London, right? and, and it was fantastic, right? And I did some mind, mind courses, and I learned to walk on the spot like I was supposed to, and I learned to do the wall like I was supposed to, and I was quite good at it, right? See that? But I did it like the teacher did it. Okay, great. But that is a dead end street, right? You see that if you if you say do it like this, well, yeah, okay, yeah, okay. But then you get into a dead end street. Um, 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 so uh, <laughs> that, that it, it died because of a, in French it's a voie de garage. I love that it's a way into a garage, you know. And you can't have a garage with with a way in one and the exit the other side. That's just a shelter. So the voie de garage in French is a great one because it's a dead end street, and that's why it died. Right. So, 
first, just a bit from a, from a perspective of observation, pantomime is the utilization of the negative mold, just so that we're, we're talking about the same term. If I have a positive mold here and I put my hand around it, I take the positive mold out, I now have the negative mold in my hand and I manipulate that negative mold to create some type of detailed story, which becomes a guessing game of what in fact am I manipulating. When I got to De Cruz, De Cruz, who in fact had taught Marcel Marceau pantomime, had already moved on to a different chapter. And the reason he said he moved on to a different chapter is because instead of playing a guessing game about what was in the hand, what are you going to do with what you have? Which is to say that we spend a great deal of time both in theater and in our lives wishing we had something rather than exploiting what we have in the room that we are in. And just from, a, and, and so that the exploitation of literally using what we have in front of us becomes much more interesting than the, than the manipulation of what we cannot see and the guessing game that thus follows. From a personal perspective, it, I'm going to say very much what Norman said. I was having dinner one night uh, with, a, with another student of De Cruz. I was a very young man at the time. Uh, and this, this student and I uh, became very good friends. He, he was deaf, and, but he could read lips perfectly. And so I would speak to him uh, both in English and in French and he could, he could tell what I was saying and he would speak. He was a speaking, non-hearing gentleman and quite brilliant. And towards the end of the conversation at dinner, he said, and the saddest thing about you, Daniel, is that you'll never be number one because I was doing pantomime on the streets at the same time as I was performing at, at, in the streets, I was taking De Cruz class and learning corporeal mime, which is an entirely different direction. And I said, what do you mean? And he said, you want to be good at what you do, no? And I said, of course, I want to be the best. And he said, that's exactly my point. You'll always be number two, because the number one spot is already taken by Mr. Marceau. <laughs> at which point I said to myself, he's absolutely right. And I will not go forward in something that I cannot aspire to be number one at. And I dropped pantomime at that moment. And I still, it's interesting because I still teach it to my students, but I teach it to my students so that they don't have to use it, if you will. I, so the wall, for example, I can make this wall and I can, I can, so I give this to the students so that they know how to use it because what's interesting in more, what we'll call more legitimate theater rather than stylized theater such as pantomime, is that this wall is still very important, that I can, I can put my hand on that idea right here. I don't need to, to, to mimic that it's there, but I put my hand on this wall and I can even push away from it in a very nuanced way. And this is actually a very powerful movement. Whereas this becomes a pushing away. This is me leaving the idea. This is me pushing the idea. This is me leaving the idea. And if we don't understand fixed point, which is another one of the, the capstones, if you will, of pantomime, that we need a, a fixed point. I need to be able to, to move around this point and the point must not move. That, that I can decide that I can gently use that fixed point as something to even, I could even embrace it without the structure, if you will, of pantomime. So I think pantomime died because it's not nearly as useful as the other tools that we have in theater. Okay, so you're- I keep coming back to theater. Well, this is wonderful. So you're bringing up the utility, uh, the continuing utility and relevance. 
So, uh, so if um, if some aspect of mine sort of died uh, a death of sorts, um, what what should we uh, value and bring back, and what belongs in our performance uh, training and so forth? What what is it that's useful, and what 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 should we value? Can I? Can I? Yeah. Yep. Pantomime. Yeah. Pantomime is a reference, <laughs> right? And it's used as part of Lecoq's training or method. He, he um, beginning of the second year, I think it's a, you have the pantomime, la phrase à Jules, which he developed, right? It is a reference. It, and when we use, use the pantomime in that phrase, you, you learn, in fact, you realize, can you articulate? Can you articulate the articulations? Can you articulate your body in space? Can you articulate how you move through space? Can you articulate an idea? Can you articulate an image? And the whole thing of pantomime is articulation. And so you learn how to articulate when you speak. Was it someone said at the top school of student, Mr. Lecoq, you said we're learning um, um, movement and vocal, but when are we doing the voice? And Lecoq said, if the body works right, the voice is there. Okay, right, okay, thank you very much. Goodbye. See, that, that was his thing. If the body's there, then the voice is there. And pantomime as a as an exercise, and, I, and it's very beautiful when it's done well, is a reference of articulation. Everything articulates. Can you articulate everything? Even your look and your feelings, and you, can you articulate an idea? And I thought, well, and then I learned, ah, an intelligent person is someone who can entertain an idea. Wow, blew my mind, right? Coming back to what Daniel said, I agree with certain things he says, of course, of course, you know, because I'm a nice man. But no, sorry, sorry, no, sorry. <laughs> the negative mold and the guessing game. And that is, I remember <laughs> that. It was guessing games. We had guessing games on the mind things. The fixed point is, and Daniel said, very important it is, as long as it moves. A point is only fixed if it moves. I don't, you know, but I'm right there, right? And, and can, can I, can I come, uh, uh, Daniel, um, I like Daniel, don't worry. I love the things that Daniel says sometimes. He said, we try to mimic it. We try to mimic it. I mean, no, hang on. Nike's uh, phrase is not just try to do it. Nike says, just do it. So if you try to mimic it, I don't know. I don't, I don't know. You, and in fact, you don't mimic it. Mimicking is a conscious effort. But there's so much of us which is not conscious. And training in this mime approach means that we get a little bit of an insight into what is in our unconscious behavior and what we don't think about and then we start to think about it and if you do that too much you go mad and, and the the mind what was fantastic with the negative mold that um that um, daniel was talking about i two three years ago three years ago there was a play a class, you know, text good text uh, in uh, the town where i live i went to see it of course and at, well, I'll do the ending. When they came, when we came out into the street, so I heard someone say, very good text, very good text. And I said, yeah, yeah, for the radio, for the radio, right? But during this play, there were some fine actors and they were acting fine, they, they were characters. But, but there was a table they had to go and there were bottles of wine and glasses. And I thought, I'm going to look at this. And the characters went to the table, uh, the character, went towards the bottle of wine, the actor got hold of the corkscrew, the actor undid it, and the actor poured the wine. Now, how do I saw that? I don't know. You have this sense. It was obvious to me that they had not gone through this passage of illusion, negative mold. The negative mold is a very positive idea, by the way. Nothing gets in the negative mold. They hadn't gone through that to get through into illusion. So when the, the character took hold of a glass, well, the actor did it. And I thought, mm, you see, you have to go through this illusion in order to act okay. instead, always, you see that? Okay. Sure. Great, thanks, uh, Norma. So, uh, Daniel, uh, articulate body expressing uh, the uh, most expressive parts of the, of the, of the body-mind, uh, so not a, a dry uh, cerebral, yeah? So, I jump back to Decru, uh, and 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 I don't jump back to Decru as a refute of anything that uh, Jacques Lecoq was teaching, because I think, in fact, both were were remarkably important to what is going on in in, in contemporary theater. 
Uh, so de Croo had done this pantomime and he, he landed on what he called corporeal mime. And, and some of the very principles that Norman was talking about, articulation is in fact the, the, the underpinning of, of de Croo's corporeal mime. And the first thing that we learn in, 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 in de Croo's corporeal mime is the scale. The same as one might learn where you're going to be learning the piano, it's the thumb, the index finger, the middle finger, you pass the thumb and you do the scale. And you can play Beethoven if you understand the scale. It's very hard to play Beethoven if you don't understand the scale. We have a scale and movement. It's the head, it's the head and neck, it's the head, neck and chest and, and so forth. As a, as a tiny demonstration of using articulation for meaning, because if we have no meaning, we have, we have movement for its own sake, which I call dance. And it's quite lovely and I enjoy it. The power is in the fact that, that well, I'll, I'll demonstrate it. So I'm looking at you very simply, and you assume I have some sort of idea. And all I need to do is this, and you see me have an epiphany. And all I'm doing is inclining my head up. I come back, if again, I'm looking at you basically neutral, and I do this, and doubt has entered my mind. At least for you, it seems as though doubt has entered my mind. So now we have epiphany, an idea, or doubt, a totally different idea. Here's another one. I go, boom. Simple rotation. But now a new idea has entered the room. And so from, from a perspective of, of articulation, and none of that is pantomime. All of that is actual. And so we're watching the human body think, if you will. And when, as, a, as, a, a, as an audience member, when I'm watching human bodies think, which is a paradox because we're watching human bodies and they move, they don't think. The brain thinks and we can't see it. The body moves and we can see it. De Croo was very fond of the idea of the three-dimensionalization of thought. And this is the three-dimensionalization of thought. Boom, or boom, or boom. Because we, we manifest in a three-dimensional world idea. And, and so there, Norman and I are totally married, that, that it's all about idea, because we ultimately a world without idea. In fact, I said this to my students yesterday. I don't know how we got onto the subject, but I have a couple of students who are watching and they will, they, they will remember me saying this to them as well. If you're in a relationship and you find yourself mostly talking about people or things, I highly suggest you find a different partner. If, on the other hand, you're in a relationship and you find yourself talking about ideas, you might in fact have something going. And if we spend our time focused on idea and the manifestation, the three-dimensionalization of idea, as De Croo was saying, we have a world that's worth living rather than a world of things which, and we get back to the, the negative mold, I'm not going to make a negative mold of an idea. I'm going to make the negative mold of a thing. And, and when we drop the world of things, we actually leave space for a world of idea. And, and, and they who say idea say empathy. And they who say empathy say compassion. And they who say compassion say a world that actually functions a lot better than a world of thing. Okay, well, thank you for those answers. Um, it, we only have time for one more question. All right, can I, can I, can I there's so many oh, things. Can I? Yes, absolutely. Okay. That's it's fantastic, right? Um, we, we, um, the first thing that you did, uh, Danny was talking about scale, right? The first thing, right, right, okay, right, all right, I'm gonna come from London in a minute. 
but it's that scale. The first thing you do at Lecoq is, can you be yourself, right? And Daniel was talking about movement for its own sake. Ah, Le Jack Lecoq would talk about the 20 movements, which is the 20th century. We should do 21 movements now, but that this movement talking about movement. And Daniel said, that's dance. It, it, it is something that, um, um, the other thing that gets to me, uh, a code is not a grammar. If you codify movement, you have to be very careful, right? You can see that um, there are all sorts of different ways of approaching movement. The objective, I suppose, is to make performers or actors who entertain an audience, I suppose, this is theater. And by the way, I think Lecoq was looking for a pretext in order to explore movement. And he, he, he was invited to, to train some actors. So I'm right and I'm completely wrong in this. But sometimes I got the impression that for Jacques Lecoq, the theater was a pretext in order for him to enjoy his life, um, doing movement and analyzing movement. See that? And so there's all the, when Daniel says something, there's all sorts of ideas come. An idea. Right, and then so you hear some people say, "Oh, Norman, I've got a great idea." And I never listen to it, never. And if I say to myself, "Oh, I've got a great idea," I never. I put it in the bin immediately, in the trash. All ideas are good. All ideas are good. You don't know if they work until you give the idea a form. Ah, right. We're not coming back to the objects, the form of objects, but all ideas are good. Okay, give it a form, and we'll see if it works or not. So those are the things that come spring to my mind when I listen to Danielle, you see? Wonderful. Then, yeah. Yeah. Now yeah. I feel like I, I'm, a, I'm a moderator at a presidential debate. Now I have to give Daniel these three minutes, okay? <laughs> Daniel, your three minutes. <laughs> no, 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 I only had two and a half. Oh, sorry. <laughs> yes, yes. Right. What I, find, what, what I find fascinating is that I love the idea that you have to give form to idea. And it, it, once again, I, 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 keep, I keep going back to theater. I think Lecoq, as de Croo, used theater. You said something quite brilliant, actually, and, and, and very beautiful, Norman, that he, that he used theater as a pretext to enjoy his life. And, and I have taken that myself. I use theater to enjoy my life. And the reason... And, and, and how it ties into mime is that, and now I need to, I need to, 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 to give a, a uh, parenthesis to what I just said, because I keep using the word mime and there is a distinction. And I'm, I, I want to underline this for, for the people who are watching this. There is a distinction, very clear distinction in my head between the word pantomime and mime. Pantomime is that world of negative mold. Here I am using the negative mold of the wall to manipulate thought. In Decruvian corporeal mime, I use the juxtaposition of shape and movement to create idea. That all I need to do, no acting here, all I need to do is this. And your idea of my ideas have changed simply because the shape in front of you has changed. And pantomime doesn't deal with that. Pantomime deals with the manipulation of things. And, and, and for me to have, to be able to utilize theater to enjoy life is for me to be able to use idea to explore life. So I'll, I'll, I'm sure that was two and a half minutes. I have a tendency to go on. Okay. He had five seconds extra. <laughs> so I just, I do, I do want to uh, sort of, uh, by the way, I've, I've, I've asked everybody to sort of feel free to put comments and questions into the chat because normally now we would transition into um, opening up uh, to the comments and so forth from the Zoom room. Um, and so we're gonna hopefully do that. Um, uh, but while we're waiting for that to, to occur, um, uh, one of the, I mean, probably it seems one of the morbidities of pantomime was that it, it became, uh, you know, Daniel, you mentioned significance. It became a sort of narrow system of meaning. And of course, uh, some of these uh, schools of mime 
uh, are also associated with quite authoritarian modes of instruction. You now there's sort of uh, very, uh, very orthodox, uh, orthodoxies emerged. So I'm just wondering how the two of you made your own way so creatively and originally um, in such an environment. You uh, clearly didn't find it to be uh, uh, voie de garage, but because you found your way through it, Norman and uh, Daniel, you clearly um, became number one in your own uh, refraction of, 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 uh, of the pris prismatic refraction of, of the light of life. So how did you do this? How did you find your originality in such orthodox environments? I had a very strong impetus to do it. Um, I'll tell you a very quick sh personal story. I met a woman and this was in France. I lived, so I lived in France from age 20 to age 40. So I was, and I had done my uh, work with De Crew, and I was an actor with French National Theater. And this woman was, was doing the costumes for the French National Theater. And I had just met her and I asked her to dinner and she said, yes. And we were having dinner and she said, so what else do you do? And I said, well, I do mime. And she said, oh, like, uh, that, that other French fellow, uh, Marcel Marceau. And I said, no, not at all. I do corporeal mime. And she said, I, what is that? And at that point, you can't, you can't do this and this and this and have anybody believe that you're doing theater. And so I decided right then I needed to write a love poem. And, I, and I'm not very good with words. So I... I wrote a love poem with two chairs and I physicalized the, I was trying to seduce a woman. And because I was trying to seduce a woman, I came up with a very creative solution to do something original because I knew that were I to give her something that was not original, she would look at it and not be interested in me. And so my whole impetus to create an entire direction of life was because I, I was, I was trying to make somebody love me. We ended up being married for 21 years and it was a wonderful relationship. And, and the reason she left me, she said, I loved theater more than I loved her. I think she was wrong, but I can't, I do have to cop to the, to the fact that I love theater dearly and truly i own this shirt because theater gave it to me i'm in this office because the theater gave it to me and i spend my life and my time trying to give back to theater all that she has given to me and i say she because i happen to be a cis straight male but and i'm in love with the theater very much as, as I would be with a uh, lover. Um, uh, Simon, um, it seems that, that Daniel sort of uh, in, a, in the ballpark of your question, would you like to unmute and, and, uh, and, and then move, we'll move to you, Norman. So it, it, would you like to uh, sort of, because it seems that he's sort of in the ballpark of what you're asking. Uh, okay, thank you. And thank you both for this, you know, enthralling conversation. I wish it could go on and on. Um, my question was when I saw Daniel doing the head articulations where up, epiphany, uh, doubt and so on, brings me back to, a, and there's not a right or wrong answer here and it doesn't really matter what the answer is, but to what extent, Daniel, do you believe those articulations hold within them universal meanings or to what extent are they sort of culturally bound or you know, relative to the cultures that people that we live in. I think they're, I think they, it's interesting. We happen to be at a, at a, at a flexion point uh, in the world where the appreciation of other culture is finally being underlined. And, and, and the whole idea that, that, that the white supremacist culture that has been that has been forcing the world uh, in a direction is finally perhaps coming to an end, uh, which would be a, a wonderful thing. And so it seems to me that, that culturally, I am sure that there are people who have an 
an other idea when I do this. That said, I haven't met any. Most of the time, when, when I do my work, I'm not trying to tell people what to see. I'm giving them a chosen ambiguity, if you will. And so when I do this, in fact, I don't want them necessarily to see what I see. I want them to see, as Norman put it, to see what they see. The same as, as don't move like I move, move like you move. Don't see what I see, see what you see. That said, I become then the spark for them to see more hopefully, okay. rather than, than see less. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, Norman, would you like to describe your relationship to orthodoxy and to uh, the possible authoritarian qualities of, of, of mime pedagogy? Yeah. I must say that, um, you must understand, I come from a little bit of a military family, right? My father was in the Royal Navy. My elder brother, who died, but you, you, and you okay? What's wrong with you? Hey, I'm, I'm fine. They turned the. <laughs> my office has a light system that if I don't move, it it turns the lights off by themselves. And I have this piece of paper. If you that... can't, Daniel, if you can't mime light by now, man. <laughs> I... <laughs> oh, come on, watch, watch, watch. <laughs> I have no internet at home and no light in my office. It's it's, 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 it's my world. No, sorry. Hang on. What am I doing? What, what, did, what was the question? Oh, that, 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 think it again. What was I this question? <laughs> no, when you um, how, how I got through orthodoxy. I'm from a military family. I'm proud of it, of it, of course. Right. My father was in the Royal Navy. My older brother was in the Air Force. Who is deceased now? The next elder brother was in the royal uh, was in the royal army in the army. He's retired now, of course. You see, and then, but by the time I got to seventeen, there was no more military service, so I didn't do it. And that's what, I think that was a big mistake by the government at that time because I think I'd have done quite well. So I I was brought up. I know when I was at the grammar school, there was the cadet force, and the and all Wednesdays we were in uniform. See, this was in the, not long after the Second World War. Anyway, you see, and I was the leading cadet. I was the boss of all the cadets in the school, you see, of 600 people in the school. I was the boss. And I love drilling people. And I have this thing. Up until the age of 18, 15, I wanted to be a vic in the Church of England. I wanted orthodoxy. Of course, of course, of course, you see. Right? And then, so, I, I'm not against all that. Then, then you learn these, how to see. Then, I did, I studied at Lecox, and then suddenly, you know, you, you begin to be able to see the world. Right? And because analysis of movements, you know, movement analysis, and, and then all these things, and then you'd be able to, to, it's better to, in a sense, seize, not understand, seize what you're looking at, seeing what you're seeing. You know, sometimes in a, in a workshop, you've been in the countryside, there's, there's a little bit of wind, and the trees are in the wind, you see, and the trees are moving, and I say, what can you see? And the people say, well, the trees are moving, and the leaves are, I say, no, 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 what can you see? Well, normally, you see, the wind is going past, you see the result of the wind, and look at the the bird flying in that direction goes faster than the same bird going in the opposite direction. No, I said, no, 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 what can you see? That's what you're looking at. And I get them, so they get a little bit hecked up. They don't, they're not, they're not going to kill me. And they, often they say, okay, Norman, what do you mean? What do you mean, what do you see? I said, look at that tree there, which is a beech. Look at that one over there, which is an elm. Look at the difference. And you can see the elasticity of the wood of that tree. You're looking at the movement. What can you see? see? And all this analysis of movement sort of opened my eyes into seeing the world. And now, orthodoxy, when I, um, I, I didn't want to be, I didn't even want to go to the clock school. A friend of mine in the village, he was a writer. When I became a teacher, a primary school teacher, he eventually said, do some, do some theatre in London. I'm going to go to the clock school in Paris. I said, oh, I didn't know why. And I went, right, and then boom, boom, boom. Then uh, a few years later, look, Mr. Lecoq said to me, you want to be a teacher here? I said, what? I didn't want to be a teacher. So all of this is not my mind, not my fault, right? If, if I make a mistake, it's not my fault. <laughs> don't worry. See, so I don't know if someone saw, so I, I, they said, you should go and do that. I don't do everything that people tell me. I ain't stupid, right? And then I became a teacher of movement, and I used to correct the people, the students who were doing the exercises at the beginning. 
and I know, no, no, they're pushing and pulling. No, no, I'm exaggerating a little bit, but I corrected them because I knew how to do those exercises, of course. And then after a year or two, two years, I think, it's fairly early in my career of teaching this, this stuff, as it were, I thought, hang on, if I can't do that mistake, what right have I to correct it? So I stopped not correcting the mistakes because there aren't any. If you can't, if you don't know how to do something, you are incapable of making a mistake. I know how to do these exercises, so I know how to make all the mistakes, right? So these, these, these the, the artists were learning, and of course, walking, you lose your balance and you recuperate. The only way that people go, that human beings go forward is by making a mistake, of course. So then I stopped correcting them, and I tried to say, you know, hang on, if you do it that way, it could be this and this and this. And I tried to use their mistake, which is a way of doing it, they're not a mistake. And so, and little by little, you know, the boom. So I was an um, Orthodox, of course, of Anglican Church and the Army, the Navy, the Royal Air Force, all of that. And then you learn how to see the world by watching what people watching and seeing what people do. And then their mistakes. Well, you know, the human walk. Everybody walks. A verb has no opinion. Walk is not an opinion. When Daryl walks up, you can see his opinion about this word, which has no opinion. And you can look at everybody and you can see how we each walk. We each have our point of view. And so one of the things that was astounding for me was I, I, I stopped correcting mistakes and saying and, and exploring. And then I wrote a little uh, a personal paper for myself of all the mistakes that the students are going to make in this lesson tomorrow. <laughs> Right, and, and you begin to say, you know what they're going to do. Now, it doesn't mean to say you're blasé, because it never comes in the right order. They always make the mistakes in the wrong order. But you begin to do that. So that was sort of an eye opener for me. And I remember Lecoq, Jack Lecoq, not Lecoq. We always say Lecoq. We always say Spanish stuff. We do true. And, and, and Lecoq said to me, Ah, Taylor, he doesn't need the four walls of a theatre. I think good. So, Amy. So that was that. I, I, I very much apologize. Is yeah. we have a number of questions in the yeah. chat, and so I thought it would be good to. So I'm I'm, a, I'm a, yeah, yeah, yeah. apologize. Um, no, no. The, so the, in order, we have uh, Aurelian. If I mean, why don't you just unmute yourselves? I mean, Aurelian, you wanted to ask Norman something, and then uh, Masha. Uh, so uh, why don't we, Aurelian? Do you still want to ask Norman something? It wasn't really so much a question. It was more oh, sort of. Yeah. Just sort of reminded me of when I had to talk a couple of weeks ago that we talked about. Um, I put in there, uh, what was it? Not to look for an idea, but let the idea come to you. But also it was um, giving meaning to things. Just sort of reminded me, you know, with the, I guess the negative space and everything. Uh, and it's funny saying with the mistakes as well, because, um, you know, obviously, you know, the stick exercise, you know, you give people a stick and say, move the stick in the space. And uh, what they do is they give the stick a meaning because we're so desperate to give things a meaning. And um, it's always a really enlightening when you actually get to a point when they see the stick just as a stick and then discover what, you know, what goes around and what the stick does. It was really just sort of an observation. Um, and, and yeah, with the whole limb, you know, I've, uh, that sort of takes it down to a, a, a different or up to a different level uh, in mm -hmm. terms of um, uh, going beyond sort of cultural meanings and, and giving things meanings to really get to a, a universal truth. Uh, I don't know if that comes into any of the stuff that you're talking about or how it comes into, into any of that. Okay. It it, it seems to me that I, I just want to jump back because I want to connect what, what Orlean was just saying to what Norman was saying about the, the differentiation between looking and seeing. Because it, it, this whole thing seems to me to be about being able to see more uh, rather than look at. Uh, there's, a, there's a directionality to pretty much everything. Right now, if I... If I I have a voice. Were we in the same room, the directionality of my voice would be very clear, that it's coming from me towards you. If I ask you to look at 
your computer, you have a sensation of directionality. And that is that you're somehow doing this, that you're looking at your computer. And the differentiation of looking at and seeing, because what in fact is happening when you're looking at your computer is again, it's not actually doing this. Even if your sensation is that you're doing this, what's really happening, physics tells us, is that the light is hitting the computer and then it's bouncing and it is in fact coming at you. When we are actually seeing rather than looking at, the directionality becomes this way. When we are looking at, it becomes project, projectile, if you will, and we project onto what we are looking at, and we don't see what we're looking at. We see what we want. When we are actually seeing things, we don't project onto them. We actually absorb what is there, and if we could do that, if we could train ourselves to have the sensation of that directionality of absorbing what we are looking at and actually see it, we would see people for who they actually might be rather than people as we want to see them. And I think the world would be a better place, but it's a hard thing to, it's a hard thing to learn. Um, Masha, would you like to unmute yourself? Yes. Uh, first of all, uh, excuse me for my English. It's not the uh, best, <laughs> but I will try to, uh, to be clear. <laughs> uh, so, um, yeah, from uh, what, I, um, what I'm, I'm thinking about at this point is um, uh, using pantomime as a tool at the theater schools to teach students. But then it can come to this um, uh, probably rigid form a little bit from the maybe teachers or, or school that they are teaching the, the classical way. Uh, they give um, the, the students, the, like you were mentioning, making a wall or um, riding a boat or um, I don't know, walking. Um, and then the students, maybe now, even in this uh, time, the students are more like copy paste minded. May I don't know how it was before, but um, so they would create a story, a creation using those tools. So it will be kind of a, a, a copy paste of the movements to create a story. Um, but like we were talking, uh, Stan was saying about the scale, for example, uh, Orthodox, a very classical pantomime, which is a, a beautiful form because you learn to articulate, to create an illusion on the stage, um, how to make a pause, how to, how to, that you have an idea, but how to articulate it into the space that audience really understand it. Um, but those movements are like kind of a, um, alphabet or like a scale, but uh, for the creative process to create a show, you cannot just put together those movements because then you just did a kind of a scale, but if you want to create a song or if you want to make a creation, then you would need to just, you would need that kind of training to, to, to learn your body and uh, to learn how can I put my idea out that it's understand not just for me, but that it's not kind of contemporary uh, theater show where you do whatever and, and the audience can imagine whatever. But if you, I really want that they understand that, but how then to make a poetic out of it? So my question now is it, is it would be then good to um, encourage the teachers or to make more seminars or something that uh, to, to inspire them to use the, the tools, but then to create a poetry out of it. Like for example, before, so I'm not creating, oh, this is the, the wall, but I'm, I'm using the mime just a little bit, just uh, to make my performance much more uh, illusionable, much more um, beautiful to watch and to understand. Because many times we watch, some performances, but you see that people are just rushing everywhere. The, they, don't, they don't touch, they don't really hold, they don't push, they don't pull. So they would actually need a basic 
mind tool, but then not use it so rigidly. So how to then, uh, for example, those schools that are using um, orly cox styles or the pantomime, how to enlighten them that there is a, a beautiful uh, alphabet or a scale, but how to make music out of it. <laughs> Thank you. I think you, Masha, I think you've really eloquently summarized some of the things that, that uh, you were saying, Daniel and Norma. It seems very, a very articulate summary, actually. Of, would you like, Daniel and Norma, would you like to say something further? Well, I think poetry is is the whole point of this. That that that, and I and, and I really appreciate Masha that 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 you 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 come back to the idea of of poetics. Um, it and, and it 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 there is a a non understanding of poetry that I really love. What, what makes something poetic is that it's not, and it goes back to the authoritarian idea, that it, is, it does not have a single meaning. When you read a poem, there are, the whole idea of the poem, at least to me, is that, is that it leaves space for other, rather than the, 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 the authority authoritarian idea that this is what you should see, this is what you should think about what you see, we present a spark that then allows the imagination of the listener or the spectator in this case to actually, to actually, it, and it's not that, that you just come up with whatever you want because the, the artist, if they in fact are an artist, send you in a direction. They just don't send you to a destination, if you will. And I think that, that if I was gonna say anything to, to acting teachers, it's that giving students destination is not useful. Giving students direction is useful so that they can take themselves where they need to go rather than where you want them to go. Norman, would you like to say something in conclusion? We're we're just have, we have two minutes. Oh, this is fantastic. See that um, um, I'm not a poet. Okay, I can't write a poem, but I can sure say if I read one, ah, oh, that's a good poem, right? The the, um, uh, the the I never use the word poetic and poetry and poem. I I don't use that because for me it, I I can't grasp it. I don't know how to. Um, uh, there are writing courses, and I know that some friends of mine have been on poetry writing courses. And I'd love to just attend to see how you train people to write a poem. I have no idea how it will be done. What I try to do, I think try to do, I said, is you, there are all sorts of tools you have, all sorts of approaches, methods. How can you analyze that? How can you analyze that? to be aware, a little bit more aware of what we do. You're never totally aware of anything. But uh, certain people, you give them these, and then who knows, like you don't tell them where to go, you tell them um, that this direction there. I'll never forget, uh, it was a, uh, when I was a student at the college, I was teaching English, well, of course you see, and then I had to, I was sent to the Renault factory just outside Paris, in fact, and it was a town which Mr. Renault himself had just enclosed in the First World War to produce tanks and cars for the war, right? And it was just a town. And I got there and I had to go to back building number, G, building J. And I got through the security and I went there and I'm looking around and I thought, where is J? And this lady was walking and I said, excuse me, could you, could you, excuse me, could you tell me where back building J is? And she said, oh yes, um, it's always, once you know the way, it's always straight ahead, but I'll, I'll go with you because it's a bit complicated. And that stuck with me forever. Ah, once you know the way, then it's always just straight ahead, but it's a bit complicated, I'll go with you. And I thought, great. She didn't tell me where to go. I mean, you know, in a positive sense, she, she sort of took me part of the way, not, not to the building, Jay. No, 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 no. But she said, you go down there, take a second left. Bye-bye, have a nice life or something like that. Oof. And showed, she showed me the way, you see, and I'll never forget that. So that was that. Was that. Wonderful. And um, Masha Thank talked you. about the classical way of doing things. I don't use the word classical way. I sort of referentials, very referential way of doing it. 
this is a reference. If you look back, it's a reference in history. You know, I, 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 do, I use that word. And then creating an illusion. Well, you know, reality is often quite el elusive. And there's a great, you know, in France, and this is just a last, last thing that comes in my head. I've got loads of phrases in my head. Some, you know, in French, you say, c'est comme si, it's as if. And a physiotherapist said to me, and I said, wow, well, c'est comme si, it's, it's as if. He said, no, 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 you don't say that, no, we don't say that. You say, comme si, say, as if, that's the way it is. And boff, you know, you don't say, it's as if, no, no, as if, that's the way it is. So that's why it's sort of a, those things that, and Gilbert, I would summarize. I'm trying to find a, a speak, a little text by Henri Michaud, a, a Belgian poet, who starts. It starts off: "I am not a poet, never have been, never said I was, and I never will be." Right or something like that. And it's a great text. It's a, it's a Belgian poet and a writer. So that's what I think. Norman. Yeah, sorry. You, Norman, you have circumvented our hard stop. Marvelous. <laughs> <laughs> that's a first. Congratulations. <laughs> Wonderful. Thank you so much for this uh, ebullient conversation. I strongly encourage you to read some of the stunning remarks and questions that are in the chat. Um, I'm so sorry we didn't have a chance to get to them. They're really quite wonderful. And um, so uh, we do not uh, close the Zoom room, but we do stop at half past or try to. So everybody can still hang around and we can address some of uh, your wonderful comments. Um, but uh, we will officially close the session. Thank you so much uh, to my guests, Daniel Stein and Norman Taylor, and to all of you for joining. Uh, please uh, do join in next week for the 20th session, uh, which is uh, the theater is a charnel ground towards contemplative performance with Diane Denis and Daniel reis Pla. Um, that will be our final session for 2020. Um, thank you so much to everyone. And uh, if you must leave the room, uh, have a good and safe week. Thank you.